What do characters such as James Bond, Vito Corleone, and Harvey Specter all have in common? Not only do they appear poised and dapper in any attire when not in action, but it's definitely without a doubt that their most dapper appearances on screen are when they're dressed in perfectly tailored and expensive suits. The suit is arguably the peak of men's fashion, and it's also a uniform representing success. Though the suit and jacket have been around for centuries, the silhouette for the modern suit as we know it was birthed in the 1800s. In this video, we'll walk you through the history and evolution of the suit as it's been seen in every decade since its introduction. As early as 1666, men had already been wearing different variations of jackets and trousers. But when King Charles II introduced the waistcoat as a new item in menswear, he changed the game and unknowingly laid the groundwork for the three-piece suit. The origins of the modern suit can be traced back to Beau Brummel, a British dandy aristocrat. It can be noted that before Brummel, menswear was mostly influenced by the French, who favoured knee breeches, stockings, and heavily embroidered fabrics such as velvet. The widely used term suit is derived from the French term suivre, which means to follow. This describes the very essence of a suit, which is a jacket that follows the pants and vice versa in a matching fabric. Beau Brummel was a key figure in the Regency era of England in the early 1800s. As a close friend to King George IV, he became something of an arbiter of men's fashion. With the power to decide what was acceptable and what was not, Brummel did away with the overly ornate and colorful designs of the French garments and began to appear in understated, yet perfectly tailored, bespoke menswear. He went on to replace the knee breeches and stockings with long trousers, boots, and plain coats. Now we know that it's not an easy feat to influence fashion trends, but Brummel was able to achieve this by riding on the wave of the French Revolution. People were already turning away from the French style as it reminded them of the struggles of the Revolution times. Something was missing, and Brummel introduced something different. Looking at the suit's design, you might argue that the top and bottom of Brummel's outfits do not match and as such should not be described as a suit. But the truth is that the entire silhouette and the toned-down color scheme laid the foundation on which the modern suit, as we know it today, was built. By the mid-1800s in the Victorian era, the world saw the introduction of the frock coat. This coat was usually black and had some semblance of the modern overcoat. It was long enough to reach the knees and tailored to either single or double-breasted. While the single-breasted version was more common and casual, the double-breasted version was favored for formal occasions. Later in the Victorian era, the two different versions of the frock coat led to a division in the one-way menswear style. The first version was the morning suit. This piece still retained the length of the frock coat, but it was tailored to only be single-breasted and had open quarters with a single button to bring them together. The second version was the lounge suit. As the name implies, this piece was designed to be casual, everyday wear. Its coat was significantly shorter in length as opposed to the frock coat. The frock coats and the morning coats usually came with matching trousers, but it was still acceptable for men to pair their coats with different pair of trousers. On the other hand, the lounge suit was only acceptable as a top and bottom pair of the same fabric. Due to this unspoken rule, people began to refer to the lounge suit as dittos, a derivatory term of ditto which means the same fabric for tops and bottoms. At the time, the morning suit was a very formal wear reserved for the elites at court. Today, the trendier version of the morning suit is even more formal, such that you would only see it at royal weddings or high society events by people who love and appreciate classic style. The case is very different from the lounge suit. Today, its version is a very formal wear for men. Although it became popular as casual wear in England during the Victorian era, we can trace its origin back to Scotland. As early as the 1850s, the Scottish were already designing a less popular design of this piece with heavy fabrics. The British would then adopt this style and make it into a three-piece garment consisting of a coat, trousers, and a vest or waistcoat. From this point, the silhouette was already developed. A few details such as jacket length, button point, the height of the gorge, width of lapel, type of fabric, and so on might change over the years, but the design was definitely here to stay. By the 1900s, the lounge suit became even more popular in the Edwardian era. 
The same could not be said for the frock coats and the morning coats. They were still around, but were only worn by older men. The fabrics were heavy, and the finishing was notably not as exquisite as it is today. Another notable feature of suits at the time was that they only came in dark-colored fabrics because the cities were filled with soot from the coal heating systems. In the first episodes of Downton Abbey, you'll see that the suits worn by people in the countryside were brighter as they had more colors and patterns when compared to the suits of those in the city. After the First World War, the 1920s ushered a more exquisite look for the suit. The suit had a strong military influence, and as such, some changes were made. The suit went from super slim to fuller, especially toward the ends. The trim of the jacket changed and featured a slightly higher buttoning point. The trousers had a very high rise, and when put together with the wide shoulder and waist suppression of the jacket, the suit created the illusion of longer legs. These Roaring Twenties are also referred to as the Jazz Age. As such, more colors and patterns were becoming more acceptable, and accessories like pocket squares and collar pins were the trend. A good reference for this time is Leonardo DiCaprio's style in The Great Gatsby. The drape suit entered the fashion scene in the 1930s. The suit was made with more fabric in the chest area, and the pants adopted a wider cut. This drape style is more refined than its predecessors and is often referred to as the golden age of classic menswear. In the 1940s, the style would change again. After the Second World War, everything had to be rationed, and fabric was no exception. The entire fashion industry had to adapt to minimalism. As such, the trims became slimmer and the lapels became narrower. The suit of the 1940s did away with waistcoats and vests, and its lean trim and slim look are very close to the modern 2020 style suit. The austerity of the 1940s was well over by the start of the 1950s. The jacket, its lapels, and trousers reverted to the wider look. Pleats were even introduced in the trousers as they gave room for more movement and comfort. At this time, the zoot suit, which is a more rebellious style, sprung up. Particularly African-American and Mexican young men navigated toward the baggy pants and long and padded shoulders of the zoot suit. A similar trend was the Ivy League style, which was more of a sack-style suit. The pants had no pleats, but the jackets featured a three-roll two-jacket. The jacket of the Ivy-style suit was single-breasted and had very little or no padding on the shoulders. By the end of the 50s, the mod suit that was usually paired with narrow ties was introduced. It featured slim fitting and straight cuts, non-pleated pants, and narrow lapels. Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack are good references to the 1950s suit style. The 1960s suits were mostly just an extension of the style of the 50s. The fabrics used were still heavy, but there was now an additional use of nylon and other artificial fibers. We can describe what would replace this style by the start of the 1970s as a low point in not just the history of the suit, but in men's fashion in general. The lapels were wide and the pants were fled. The suit trend was definitely flashy, but just not in a memorable way. The suits in the 1980s were model power suits. Influencing the new styles were faces like Giorgio Armani and Michael Douglas. The suits brought back the double-breasted jackets and full-cut pants. The power suit of the 80s was so popular because it was a direct expression of capitalism and the excesses of the time. In the 1990s, the power suit was another low point in the history of the suit. The pants were long and baggy, the jackets featured three to four buttons, and it was just awful. Thankfully, the millennium was off to a good start. The 2000s saw the return of the minimalist and generally slim style. The suit of 2010 was quite similar, with an even more classic look. The history of the suit cannot be complete without turning to Savile Row. As London is undeniably now the global capital of menswear, Savile Row Street is known even more so to be the center of the best bespoke and made-to-measure suits in the world. Savile Row is home to big brands such as Anderson & Shepard, Jeeves & Hawks, Cat & the Dandy, and Huntsman & Sons, just to mention a few. Several designers also received training and have gone on to make names for themselves. One of such is Lee Alexander McQueen, who has designed suits for Tom Hiddleston, Jack Houston, Jamie Dornan, and Tom Hardy. In more recent years, the style for suits has gotten more looks with different textures and sometimes brighter colors. They've also been featured in many red carpet events worn by famous celebrities and representing the who's who in the fashion world. 
But one thing that holds true no matter who wears the suit, Harry Hart from the Kingsman movie definitely said it best. A suit is the modern gentleman's armor.